So after development into late childhood, you have the transition from childhood to adolescence. Uh, that is going to be initiated, depending on the person, uh, it's initiated uh, at a different time, but roughly you can assume that adolescence is going to set in anywhere between the ages of uh, some as early as 11 or 12 uh, to about 14, 15, maybe 16 uh, for the more uh, late bloomers. What initiates this process is the um, uh, activation of what's called puberty, uh, and that is a genetically determined as far as the blueprint and timing as to when it initiates. Um, it's going to be part of the maturation process where several sequences of uh, physical changes in the biology, in the, uh, in the brain and, and just in biology in general throughout the body occur, and that's going to change the individual's behavior, abilities, um, personality, and things like that. And this is also usually puberty where we start see seeing a lot more of those characteristic uh, uh, gender differences which we'll get to uh, as far as which ones are, are environmental and which ones are, are more so genetic. Um, so, adolescence is initiated by puberty. Um, so what this basically does for, for boys and girls is uh, they get a, a, uh, a rush of hormones. Uh, males tend to get far more testosterone, whereas females tend to get far more estrogen. And uh, as we talked about in the uh, uh, prenatal uh, development in the gestation period, hormones have a significant impact on how the brain and body develop, uh, which is why this puberty process, when it's activated, which again is generally activated genetically as far as when, at what point in that person's life, um, it's going to affect their development going forward. So uh, you get a rush of hormones, uh, the more masculine hormone being testosterone, the more feminine hormone being estrogen. I should put test with testosterone. Estrogen. In fact, uh, these two are going to peak here uh, for both genders uh, at this point in time, especially males. And what we talked about earlier in Unit 2 was about how uh, testosterone uh, is associated with higher levels of aggression. It's positively correlated. That's going to be true here in puberty uh, as well uh, in this adolescent phase. Um, so we get a surge of hormones, uh, and you're going to see this is again part of the maturation process. And what's going to occur here is you're going to have several ability, uh, body, and behavioral changes. Um, so some of, but not all of them, uh, include uh, for physical changes. You're going to have things like um, mostly due to the presence of these hormones. The appearance of body hair. Uh, for boys, you start to see it, um, generally speaking, uh, you start to see it more uh, more facial hair, or at least it begins. Uh, it doesn't usually set in fully till 20s and 30s, maybe even later for some people, uh, for some guys or girls, but depending. And uh, you get body hair, of course, under the arms and in the uh, pubic regions as well. So body hair is going to uh, change. You're going to see them in the typical, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Matured, at least sexually matured, uh, adult. And this is also the point where uh, individuals reach sexual maturity. So this means they can actually uh, conceive children at this age. Uh, this is going to be too early to optimally have children, but it's possible to have children. And this was more important several hundred years ago, well, not even several hundred, 100, 200 years ago, when uh, long lifespans were not common. So having kids at a younger age was um, not advised, but it, it helped continue the uh, passing on of genes um, hereditarily. All right, so you got body hair, uh, you have sexual, they reach sexual maturity, um, so they can have children, and uh, they're also gonna notice some physical changes uh, in their body as far as their voice. So like, for example, males, their voices are gonna become uh, deeper, they're not gonna sound like that, they're not gonna have a high-pitched uh, boy voice for the most part, uh, younger boy voice. Um, you're also gonna have changes in the actual structure of the body. This is usually where, um, Whereas before, boys and girls were roughly the same size. This is where most males tend to uh, grow at a much faster rate uh, when they begin puberty. Uh, and that usually makes them, uh, I think on average, about five inches taller or so um, at, in adulthood. Uh, so they're gonna have a, a growth spurt for the most part. Uh, boys are on average taller, but of course you can have some very tall women or some very short boys. But on average, uh, men I think are five or six inches tall. I think it's five inches taller. Uh, so you have a growth spurt. You're also going to uh, get uh, some changes in muscle mass and body fat composition. Um, so uh, boys, for example, males uh, experience uh, an increase in muscle mass, particularly in the upper body. The lower body stays closer um, to uh, the same between boys and girls, 
uh, men still do have an advantage, but it's, it's much smaller. But in the upper body, it's quite a bit different. Uh, so you have a, a muscle mass uh, difference here. So again, this is where you could have uh, a boy and a girl that are relatively the same pre-puberty, but after puberty, um, you have the change in actual uh, physical anatomy. Uh, muscle mass is gonna increase. I think boys have 40% more in the upper body. Uh, and women are going to accumulate more body fat um, as their breasts develop in, in other parts of their body. Uh, and they just store them differently. It doesn't mean one's better than the other, it's just they're just different, essentially. Uh, and then uh, females uh, are gonna accumulate, I think it's 60% more body fat or so. All right, other differences are going to include, uh, this one isn't a difference between gender, it's for both, but this is where, uh, individuals get the ability to uh, think abstractly. So they can do perform tasks like more complex equations in math, like algebraic equations, uh, other formulas, calculus, things like that become possible because you can actually begin to understand abstract systems. So abstract thought is possible, complex thought. You can now, while you're still gonna be kind of egocentric, sort of see the world as revolving around you to some extent, this is the age where you can much more clearly understand the perspective of others. Not as good as you can as an adult, but this is where you have that ability to think about why is that person doing that? How do my actions affect them more clearly than, than kids do? Who, who still catch on to it, but it's much easier here. Uh, and you can also practice hypothetical thought, hypothetical. So it's much easier for adolescents to think about what if scenarios or what, what will happen if I do this in the long term, um, they're able to, to essentially align their behavior with goals based on the future. So here's where they start generally, not that they pick it permanently, but they start thinking about what they want to do with their lives as far as career, and they start orienting their lives towards that more clearly and focused than uh, when they were younger. It doesn't mean when you're younger you don't want to be something, but in adolescence people start figuring out more so as they experiment what their personality is like and what kind of job or life they would want and they start working towards it more diligently uh, and clearly than when they are, are children. And that, of course, continues to progress as the frontal lobe develops. It's all frontal lobe initiated. So uh, these last few, hypothetical thought, planning, abstract thought, etc., those are uh, part of the maturation process that has to do with increased frontal lobe development. Uh, and the consolidating of connections up in the frontal lobe. That, as I mentioned before, goes all the way into adulthood. It finishes, on average, in your mid-20s, as late as about 27 years old or so, until that's fully done. So that's sort of the physical changes uh, and some of the cognitive changes. You also generally have, um, so here's for more behavioral, uh, there tends to be a shift in focus for adolescents from um, family relationships to a focus on friends, peer relationships. So it doesn't mean that you completely reject your parents or dislike them, but you tend to focus less on your relationship with your parents and more on uh, generating a, a, uh, what's the word? a circle of friendship or a network of friends outside of the family uh, with your peers, generally at school. So a parent to peer, focus on relationships. And again, some individuals still stay really tight with their parents, others not as much, but nonetheless, you expand your circle of, of, of connection to more than just your immediate family um, compared to when you're a, a child. And in some cases, sometimes the uh, connection with the friend is actually more than the parent, or at least for, a, for a, a segment of their life. All right, so that's some of the behavior differences. Um, and because of these bodily changes and these ability changes, we actually see, uh, begin to see some divergence um, as far as how puberty affects the various genders. And again, these are all on average, uh, and I'll mention that again when we talk specifically about gender differences. So anytime I'm talking about males get this, females get this, it doesn't mean all males are females, it just means on average they do. So you can have individuals that do or don't um, fall under these uh, descriptions or characteristics uh, in either gender. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue going on that. So early onset, so the, the individuals that begin puberty at 12 or 11 sometimes, uh, and I think sometimes women can even go earlier than that, um, there's different ramifications for early onset puberty. So early onset, 
that can be positive or negative. For males, early onset in puberty is, uh, at least in the short term, usually a good thing. Uh, it means they're gonna grow quicker, they're gonna gain more muscle mass, uh, they'll be stronger, faster, can jump higher, taller, bigger, all of those things. They're also, also more confident. Testosterone um, is, is somewhat correlated with confidence. Where did I write that? There, uh, with confidence. So males tend to be, uh, uh, it tends to be a uh, bonus or a benefit during adolescence. Tends to be, not always, but tends to be, because they have an increase in size and strength and speed, uh, which generally makes them better at sports and uh, less likely to be um, bullied. And they're also going to be um, generally more popular because of that, um, because of their athleticism or uh, I guess you could say social dominance. Um, females though, well again this isn't for every single female, it tends to be a little more mixed on the results. Uh, females, of course, are going to, um, since they onset, early onset for females is even earlier than early onset for males, uh, it can be a little awkward because when you're the first one or two people in your class of 30 to engage in puberty, all of a sudden you spurt up taller than everybody else and you start developing some of these physical traits and that can actually make you a target for um, uh, social, what's the word for it? not jeering, being made fun of essentially, uh, being picked on, you could say. So females, when they hit, uh, hit puberty early, again, it's usually before anybody in their class and they'll immediately have all these changes, including the hormonal changes uh, that might change their moods or cause their moods to be less stable um, uh, or s subject them to scrutiny from peers because uh, they start having a period and none of the other kids even know what that is. Um, so they are often more, they can be subjected to scrutiny, subjected to peer scrutiny uh, from boys and girls. Um, and that can cause them to feel alienated or isolated. So um, they generally tend to uh, prefer older friends which can be fine, uh, at least for a time, but it does also make them, and males, too, I forgot to mention this, in both cases, they're much more likely to, uh, in the case of a female, uh, become pregnant earlier than they want to, so during high school, for example, or uh, maybe a part of a partnership that experiences a pregnancy as the male, since they can't carry children, obviously. So they're more likely, uh, more likely to, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? drop out of high school uh, due to pregnancy. Same with males, but um, slightly different reason. Uh, and also males, I forgot to mention, are much more likely to be uh, delinquent uh, because of that surge of testosterone and that extra aggression. Uh, they're much more likely to be aggressive and to um, act out and quote unquote rebel against authority, whether it's their teachers, their parents, whatever, and be subjected to um, punishment. So they're much more likely to be uh, delinquent, whether it's being punished at school, potentially punished outside school in the public, um, uh, at a juvenile detention center, or later in prison. Uh, they're more likely to experience all of those things. And both categories are more uh, likely to, so this is male and female, uh, more likely to uh, suffer from or be caught up in alcoholism and uh, potentially other uh, drugs as well to uh, abuse substances. The most common and easiest one to obtain access to is uh, alcohol, um, especially males. Uh, they're more likely to be caught up in that uh, if they hit pu puberty early. But again, if you hit pu puberty early, that doesn't mean this is all going to happen. It's just more likely to uh, compare to those that uh, don't hit pu puberty early. Uh, but it can also be troublesome to experience it late when you're the uh, late bloomer uh, in your in your in your class um, so there's everyone has their own I guess you'd say demons to struggle with uh, as they grow up but that's essentially the sort of path of development that they experience um, this is also when those gender differences become pronounced but I will uh, I will get to that in a second let me first talk about as you transition to early adulthood and let me make sure I didn't forget any major things we got cognitive physical behavioral and the impact and how that's um, initiated, which is largely hormonally based. And again, don't forget, as we talked about in Unit 2, hormones have a major impact on how your body uh, abilities and behavior uh, forms as you age. Okay, so uh, the next step would be on to uh, early adulthood.
Uh, and in fact, there's kind of a new term associated with this. It's called emergent adulthood. Uh, and that is a term designated for an adult who is over 18, so legally they have a lot of extra rights that were not guaranteed to them as minors, which is 17 and below. Um, but they're often still quite dependent on their parents or somebody else. So they have a lot more independence, but they're not entirely independent yet. So uh, you could call this early adulthood or emergent adulthood. This last emergent adulthood. Uh, and this is again, it, it varies. You could say 18 to possibly 27. That's a little late, but you, you could extend it to that. Certainly your late teens, early 20s uh, would be lumped in. And depending on the individual and the situation, you could extend it further into their 20s. Um, so this is again, the phase of uh, increased independence, uh, but there's also still gonna be some uh, dependence on other adults, usually parents for uh, financial aid uh, or housing. That essentially means it's really tough to graduate high school and go to college or start some uh, entry level career uh, and all of a sudden just pay for everything. So especially nowadays, since the 80s or so, uh, it's been much more, well 90s certainly, it's been much more common for adults to get out of high school and not just immediately start their careers, get a house and a family. It's usually delayed because financially it's not as viable as it was before. Um, now a lot of those jobs that were entry level, and I'm not, I'm not by the way, like optimistically misremembering the past here because most of these jobs were not pleasant. But in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there were a lot more production manufacturing jobs available. Uh, so people could leave high school and jump right into a career, uh, start out and, and, and get a mortgage and, get a car, et cetera, start a family earlier than now. Now the jobs are different. Uh, so things are a little bit more expensive. I don't think real income's dropped. I think it's actually increased, but most jobs now, you can't just walk out of high school and start a career. Um, you're going to start quite low, where the pay's not enough to pay for these things all by themselves, or you're going to re require several years of college and or other uh, professional training, uh, which you of course have to pay for, and you're also not able to um, Fund, for, fund yourself generally. So most people have to uh, borrow money in the form of student loans. Uh, they generally can and do maintain part-time jobs, maybe even full-time jobs, but it's usually not enough when they include their schoolwork or, or, or career training uh, to be fully independent without some sort of help from uh, the government or from um, a student loan agency or their parents for housing and, finan and finances. So again, where you have a lot of freedom and choice in your life, but you're still dependent on others for, for help. And as you get older, um, that, that dependence on others decreases uh, until it's largely gone uh, by mid to late adulthood. Uh, and then of course you start getting into really late life when you start becoming more dependent on others again, but uh, it's kind of like a, a, a peak. Uh, and your independence is sort of peaking in your 30s, 40s, and, and 50s. All right, so that's emergent adulthood. Uh, there also tends to be more of a focus, uh, focus shifts back towards family, generally speaking. It doesn't mean you lose your friends, because you definitely do not, especially if you're still going to college or something like that. But whereas in high school, your family sort of took care of you while you went out and fostered social relationships, now you're, uh, you're more so on your own. So you do have that tight uh, friend group, but you're focused on, generally speaking, doing one or both of these, focusing on your career and or focusing on uh, developing a family. Uh, generally not right out the gate are you focused on the family part, uh, but at some point between ages um, 18 to 27, usually the latter end, people start thinking at least about when and or if they want to have a family, like get married, have kids sort of thing. Uh, and certainly they're gonna be focused on their career here. So the focus shifts to, uh, shifts to uh, career, and family uh, goals. And that could be a, a one or the other or both. Uh, most people, it ends up being both, uh, but some people choose just to go the career route uh, and some people choose just to go the family route, uh, but most do go for both. Um, that's sort of the transition to early adulthood. Uh, and it's important to remember here that even though, especially in late teens, early 20s, 
you are independent, you are an adult, and there's a lot of legal rights you do have, especially when you reach 21. You pretty much have all legal rights, um, except for that insurance, uh, renting a car. You go with 25 for that one. Um, brain development is still, still not complete. So your judgment, your ability, your personality are not entirely developed. You have a really good clue as to where that's going and your abilities in adolescence as you continue that frontal lobe development, but that's not gonna be completely done until you are mid to late 20s. Uh, I think on average about 27 is the marker where almost everybody's completed the development of their frontal lobe, uh, with some exceptions. So, uh, so from uh, 18 to 27, the uh, frontal lobe continues uh, to develop. And I mean that as in become more efficient, consolidated. So this is where your judgment gets better, your ability to think rationally gets better. Um, your impulse control is generally improved. You have a really good idea of exactly what you want, how you want to get it, who you are as a person. Uh, most people haven't figured it out entirely. Uh, maybe they never will, but you have a much better idea of you and what you want by this age, uh, 27, than you do at 17 uh, in, in adolescence. So that's kind of what emergent adulthood is. Uh, and again, it's a little new uh, as far as uh, the dependence on um, financial institutions or the government or parents, but that's what it is. Increased independence, but still some dependence as you develop uh, and as you begin to set your goals and your frontal lobe completes its uh, maturation process. All right, so what we'll do now is we'll move on to uh, gender differences, uh, which can be kind of a hot topic uh, as well as sexual orientation. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, what some of those differences are on average, uh, which ones of those can be explained by biology, and one of those, which ones of those can be explained by uh, environment as far as hormonal exposure uh, and or actual society and culture. So gender differences. Uh, before I start out, I do want to dis, uh, specifically state that we are talking about average population differences. not individual determination, determinism. Uh, so the following are all the average differences based on you know millions or billions of uh, questionnaires and people surveyed and statistics as far as like all males go and all females go. This doesn't mean if one characteristic defines the average male that every male has to or does have this or that a female cannot have it or vice versa. So I just wanna be real clear about that, especially uh, nowadays and on the internet. We're talking about population averages. We're not talking about every individual is automatically defined by this because that is not the case. It just means that most males do or don't have this or most females do or don't have that. Uh, before I get into that, let's talk about the uh, actual gender spectrum here. Um, Whereas, because uh, this is also a, a hot topic of, of whether gender even exists. So we're talking about biological sex here, and there is actually three variants. The vast majority, literally 99.9% .9 of people, uh, fall under two categories. That is biologically male, which means they contain an XY chromosome, which has their DNA in it. Biologically female, which are defined by an XX chromosome, which has their DNA in it, and that um, one one hundredth uh, of a percent uh, can be intersex, which is an abnormality. That doesn't mean that they're deformed or uh, incorrect or incompetent by any means, but it is abnormal and that it is not um, like the other 99.9%, uh, but they're still fully functionally and capable human beings uh, that have inherent value as well. And they're defined by an XXY uh, chromosome. Most of the time, they do have characteristics that are physical characteristics that are uh, more so male or female, but you can have some variance uh, in appearance. Most of the time, though, you won't be able to just uh, tell uh, someone's chromosomal uh, makeup just based on an instantaneous look uh, at their appearance. Um, but they certainly uh, do exist and they deserve to be recognized for that because even though it is just one one hundredth of a percent, that equates to millions of people in a seven you know, plus billion people world. Uh, so those are the three technical categories, but again, the vast majority of people, and what we're gonna talk about here, what we have data for uh, are males and females, and we'll also talk about uh, identities based on that as we go down. But first, let's, let's establish what these uh, traditional differences are. So 
Again, on average, you have some differences, so we'll go males uh, first. Males are on average more aggressive. Um, I think the ratio is about, or the percentage is 60-40 as far as um, uh, aggression. So if I were to randomly choose a male and a female out of the population, there's a 60% chance the male is more aggressive and a 40% chance the female is more aggressive. So they're really close, well, the actual two curves. Um, but there's some differences at the extreme, which we'll talk about here uh, in, um, uh, in more detail. So males are more aggressive uh, on average, slightly, uh, 60% compared to 40%. But there's a pretty big difference at the extremes, which we'll get to. Uh, before I can get to that, the aggression actually is usually manifested differently too. So males are more aggressive, but males and females tend to show that aggression differently. Uh, so let me describe what that means, what I mean by that. So males tend to be, uh, their aggression tends to be more confrontational, like face-to-face, -face, call you out, insult you directly, uh, or um, they're much more likely to get into a physical altercation. So males are more likely to be physical and confrontational. And then we're talking more likely here on average. It doesn't mean every male is like this or every female isn't. Um, females, while almost equally aggressive, uh, do tend to manifest it differently. Uh, females, and again, this is what you would probably think of as uh, being uh, classified as, as, as toxic masculinity, and perhaps it is. Uh, but then the uh, flip side would be what you might consider toxic femininity, and this is how female aggression is generally manifested. It's generally relational, more indirect. So, uh, and again, not always, but on average it is. What that means is females are much more likely to exhibit aggression in the form of gossip, of ostra, uh, ostracization, which means sort of excluding people. Uh, so ex deliberately excluding people from social events or invites or conversations or pictures or whatever it might be. Um, and they're much more oriented towards reputation destruction. Uh, and that kind of goes along with the, with the gossip. Uh, it's a lot less confrontational. There's almost never a physical altercation. And when there is, it's pretty much the end of any chance of a relationship with uh, the two parties if there's a female physical altercation. Uh, or as men, for whatever reason, just because two guys get into a fight, that actually doesn't mean that they're going to be enemies. In fact, sometimes they end up uh, mending their relationship, becoming friends afterwards. With females, that tends not to happen on average. Um, so it's more relational aggression. And what we mean is uh, things that I think we can all agree are, are not positive. Gossip, um, ostracizing their uh, uh, enemies, excluding them intentionally, making them feel alienated, not included in the group, uh, or reputation destruction. Uh, so lying about them, uh, whether the gossip is true or not, it, it's an attempt to do damage indirectly about the person in the social group, not directly uh, as a person. So again, males tend to be more confrontational and physical, females tend to be more relational and indirect and socially oriented rather than individually oriented. Nonetheless, both aggressive, <coughs> but males are slightly more aggressive on average. <coughs> I need my water. All right, so uh, males are, are more aggressive. They're also more likely to suffer from certain uh, psychological disorders. So they're more likely to uh, suffer from an antisocial disorder. So they're much more likely to be sociopaths, psychopaths, um, or exhibit other antisocial behaviors. They're much more likely to be um, uh, on the autism spectrum. So lacking that ability um, to socially calibrate or understand the social norms of others, that would technically be, be considered at least those characteristics, antisocial behavior, uh, but they're much more likely to be um, lumped in there in the autism spectrum. They're also more likely to be intellectually disabled. Uh, since the, when we talked about the uh, intelligence differences, the curves are slightly different, the average is the same, but since the male curve is a little flatter, that means on the extremes, uh, males tend to be um, have far more people in the intellectual disability, but they also have slightly more people also on the um, super, super, super genius level gifted uh, level as well, intellectually disabled, but also uh, intellectually gifted. But again, the averages are the same between genders, and that doesn't mean that women can't fall on the intellectually disabled uh, end, and they also doesn't mean they can't fall on the intellectually gifted genius level end either. There's just slightly less women on both extreme ends. Oh, speaking of extreme ends, this aggression thing, um, 
the male curve is shifted, so they're the same shape for males and females, but females are a little, the, the shift is a little bit more towards the non-aggressive side, right? Which is why you get that 60%, 40% difference. Uh, because of that, because the male curve is shifted over a little bit more towards the aggressive side, all of the most aggressive people, like that extreme measure, like the one, two, three percent more aggressive, most aggressive people, they're almost all males, and that's why those individuals almost are always the ones that end up in prison for violent crimes. Um, so they're much more likely to end up in prison, uh, violent crimes slash prison. Uh, the amount of people in prison for violent crimes are almost all men. There are some females that make it in there, of course, but it, they're outnumbered by at least 10 to 1, if I remember correctly. It's something ridiculous like that. Um, <clears throat> what other differences do males have that I'm forgetting? Uh, the body differences we've mentioned, they're on average a little taller, a uh, little bit more muscle mass, a little less body fat, uh, and things like that. But I think that's, oh, interests, interests. Males tend to be more interested in things rather than people. Uh, females, which I'll write over here, I kind of, I'll just do it right over here, females. Females, um, they tend to be, I'll go down, keep on the same line, more interested in people than things. I think it's about a nine to, nine to one ratio as far as their interests go. All right, but we can have exceptions here. So what I mean by that is um, careers and interests oriented with um, objects and machinery and abstract ideas that apply to that, like engineering, computer programming, robotics, uh, most STEM fields, which is science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's like a 9 to 90% male field for the most part, uh, and that's because most males uh, inherently have an interest uh, towards things, and most women have an interest that's directed towards people. Um, so the question was 30 years ago, uh, is that because of social engineering? Like, are you raised and told that boys are supposed to like this stuff and women are supposed to like this stuff? And that became a popular theory that uh, that was why we have this disparity between the two. It's like, well, then why are all the people-oriented jobs like uh, the medical field, most medical uh, practitioners, um, nurses, things like that, caregivers, teachers, um, what else is there? Anything having to do with people, the community, or helping others, overwhelmingly dominated by women. Anything having to do with systematic, abstract thought, application, things, uh, in general engineering for the most part, tends to be dominated by men, and they thought that was because of, again, this sort of like social norm that we accept. But it turns out that it's actually the reverse. This is a reflection of a, an average biological difference. And again, I say average because we still do have 10% of men that prefer people-oriented things, and we still do have roughly 10% of women that prefer um, thing-oriented things. Like I'm an example of that right here. Um, I am not interested at all in the most part in mechanical engineering and things and objects. I've always been oriented towards people, uh, even if it is more systematically applied. Um, it's more like a social engineering or social understanding of, of constructs, but still, I, I'm profoundly interested in people and I am uh, bored, generally speaking, by physical objects. So you can have exceptions to this at about, a, on average, of about a 10% rate. So again, don't think this is a male, you have to like this, or for female, you have to like this, because we do, uh, of course, have individuals who vary on that. This is the average. Um, but we did have a lot of extensive studies because people were wondering, well, why is this? Is it because we're pushing males to do this and females to do that, or, or telling them they can't do these things? Uh, but it turns out that uh, it's mostly biologically driven, and we've got a lot of studies to back that up. In fact, there's three national scale studies that show this, three national scale. So we're talking uh, studies confirm. One was in 2009 and two were in 2018. Uh, one of them was an analysis of the Scandinavian countries, which are the most gender equal by any marker in the entire world as far as trying to eliminate any sort of bias that pushes males one way or females the other way. Sort of as it should be saying you can do whatever you want, an equal opportunity sort of uh, presentation. Um, and uh, they all confirm the same thing. As countries become more 
gender equal, meaning they're not trying to push you to go one way or the other, it actually increases the amount of difference you have uh, as far as, so rather than if let's say it was society who was responsible for pushing males into thing-oriented fields or pushing females into uh, people-oriented fields, if you got rid of the social push, it should even out. But it actually got worse uh, as far as the differences between the two. So what they've concluded from these studies and other ones too, these are three national st scale studies. What they concluded is if you control for so society, like you take the social factor out, uh, the genetic differences uh, maximize uh, at about a 9 to 10 rate. Um, so just because you're a guy and you like these things or a girl and you like these things, it doesn't mean it's because you've been socially doctrinated to do that. Um, that just means you're more interested in that thing uh, biologically. So we've got three national scale studies that confirm that. And again, these are huge population scales. Um, so the, uh, the data is quite uh, clear uh, and concise. And there's also, by the way, uh, multiple pre-socialization uh, studies that confirm this as well. So here's an example. several pre-socialized studies. So they did this with um, chimpanzees and with toddlers. So toddlers at around age two, they're not influenced by society yet. They're not even capable of understanding it. Even the behaviors they see, they can't mimic it yet. They only know, they might be able to parrot words and communicate what they want, but they can't understand how the world actually works or mimic it uh, effectively. After age two and three, they are able to do that. So they could start playing and like, you know, being the dad or the mom or the baby in the family. But before that, they're not really able to do that because they can't comprehend it. So kids at or before age two, um, when they would neutrally present a thing and oriented object and a people oriented object. So like a doll, for example, for people and a truck, for example, for things. And they give um, two and younger uh, kids the choice of like, here's the uh, doll and here's the truck. Nine out of 10 boys choose the uh, truck or the thing-oriented object, and nine out of 10 girls choose the uh, uh, doll or other baby-oriented thing uh, with no social influence whatsoever, uh, all right? And then, and that, that's a, that of course is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, oh man, I'm forgetting the word. Corroborated by these uh, two studies when it's sort of confirmed the, the, the analyses match up. They also did it with non humans. They did it with uh, chimpanzees, same result. Uh, when chimpanzees, young chimps, were presented with a thing or a, a doll, they would, male chimps overwhelmingly chose the thing oriented object, and female chimps overwhelmingly chose the people oriented object, like the doll or whatever it was. Uh, so this has multiple studies um, to back it up. <clears throat> uh, and again, we have largely in the West here done a decent job of, of, of up allowing properly, allowing uh, as it should be equal opportunity. So not saying men can only do these things and women can only do these things. We sort of uh, leave it open to people. That was uh, mostly after the 1960s and the second wave feminist movement, um, which was not only a social movement, but also a technological one. One that um, uh, in the 1960s, birth control for women, reliable birth control became available. So women could delay childbirth or stop having children uh, when they wanted to and focus on their career and things like that. Also household appliances made the amount of time it took to do housework. It went from like six to eight hours, which was a full-time job down to like two. Um, so that women were, um, who were at home, you know, who had kids or whatever, had way more free time to go and pursue part-time or full-time work uh, as well. Uh, and that of course, Created a flood of women getting the job market, and then we had to, of course, remove some barriers that were there uh, for for women that limited them, uh, which we've done, uh, thankfully, and that's that's a wonderful thing because now we've got uh, all of the talented, gifted, and driven men and women out there that want to be uh, out there benefiting all of us uh, in the economy, uh, and this this is a, a reflection of that um, as far as allowing people maximal uh, agency and choice pertaining to their particular interests. All right, um, so that's. Average gender differences, obviously you have individuals that vary. Um, what else did I want to say about males and females? Let's go over uh, to the females then and, and start uh, categorizing their differences since we've already started down here. So preference for people over things on average, uh, which we've already talked about. Um, males are more likely for these uh, psychological disorders, but females have their own set of psychological disorders that they're more um, prone to. And a lot of this is based on personality difference, which we'll talk about in um, unit seven. 
but the statistics for personality, by the way, are, are just as concise. We have excellent metrics and excellent studies and sample sizes uh, to show that. So <clears throat> women who are generally um, in trait neuroticism, which is a big five personality trait that we'll talk about in unit seven, a, a highly uh, psychometrically analyzed and well-measured um, factor, um, because they're generally higher neuroticism, and they think because that's based on evolutionary psychology, um, because they've traditionally been the ones that have to handle infant care, uh, which are, are creatures that are very dependent, very vulnerable to, uh, to dying from neglect or, or environmental harm, um, that it's made females slightly more on average um, sensitive to negative emotion, like anxiety. Um, so as a result, on average, and this isn't all females, uh, females are more uh, likely to uh, suffer from anxiety disorders and depression, anxiety and mood disorders. So anxiety, of course, is things that worry you, cause a stress reaction, um, cause you to be maybe more frantic, your systems are alerted, uh, and it can uh, impair your judgment a bit if you're in one of these episodes where things feel more severe or pressing than they actually may be. Um, as well as mood disorders, which can include depression, which is, you know, a state of, of, of hopelessness and despair and uh, lethargy, just a lack of energy, um, or the bipolar versions, which can have uh, bouts of depression, but also bouts of mania, which is like super high energy and optimism to the point that you're naive, like, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Let me put all of my money into this one stock and, and then the whole thing goes or, or whatever it might be. Or let's go on a trip to England right now and forget my job. I'll get another one and off they go. And, uh, they, they've... Uh, severely impaired uh, the long-term and medium to long-term success of their life. Uh, men, of course, can suffer from these too, but just women suffer on average uh, more frequently from them. Uh, they're also more likely to suffer from images, uh, image issues, um, so they're much more uh, prone to eating disorders, whether that's anorexia or bulimia uh, or the binging purging cycles, they're more likely to suffer from those. Um, there's one that I'm forgetting disorders, eating disorders, stress and anxiety. Oh, uh, women tend to actually, this is not a disorder, but they tend to live uh, on average about five years longer than men. This has actually come down over the years uh, because men, one of the burdens of men historically has been they had the more dangerous jobs. Like they were the ones that went down into the, you know, unregulated uh, mines that would collapse and the railroad workers before there were um, a lot of institutional protections and uh, conflicts and wars were generally fought by men. Um, so it tended to mean men died a lot sooner. But now that we've sort of made society a bit safer and we have a lot less warfare, thankfully, um, uh, on average, uh, the uh, numbers have come a bit closer. But men do die on average about five years earlier. And they think that's because men have higher metabolisms. Um, they've noticed a correlation uh, in all species with metabolism. It basically means the faster your metabolism, the quicker you die. Uh, and the slower your metabolism, the longer you live. They think that's because you're um, depleting your, uh, and damaging your DNA and the telomeres, the tail ends of your chromosomes that keep your DNA uh, regulated. They deteriorate those uh, quicker over time. Uh, so that's why mice have such a short lifespan because their metabolism is super high, whereas things like turtles some seals, or sorry, some whales and things like that have very slow metabolisms and they live really, really long lives. Um, I think that might be why. So they live longer um, and they are of course less aggressive and this should actually be over here. Uh, their aggression is also manifested differently. It's more relational rather than confrontational. So those are the average basic sex differences. Uh, it's at least something to discuss, but again, I have to say it again, their averages, it doesn't mean as an individual you are doomed to or bound to these characteristics, we're just talking averages. Um, and while there are some social, of course, uh, influences on that, a lot of these are genetically uh, driven, um, at least a higher percentage of them is affected by um, biology than society. But society, of course, is gonna have uh, some impact uh, wherever you uh, actually are. So those are average gender differences. Um, and to conclude this, this section on, on, on uh, gender differences, there's a, a set of uh, new ideas that uh, have emerged with some controversy. Nonetheless, they are here. And we live in a, in a, uh, in a liberal democracy. 
and people should absolutely be allowed to exercise their own personal agency and choice. Um, so we have some new terms uh, to discuss and um, define and, and sort of um, explain what they actually are. So one of the uh, major controversies is one uh, referred to as gender identity. So this is where somebody who maybe is a male with an XY chromosome, they don't feel internally like a male, they feel as if they are actually uh, a female, uh, or maybe intersex or, or something else. So that's what we call gender identity. Uh, this is your internal um, acceptance or feeling of who you are regarding your gender. So that's my inner, inner perception uh, or feeling of being a, being a gender that doesn't match my biological sex. Um, some people who experience this uh, transition, um, they, uh, they're part of the, the very small, but absolutely still there, uh, transgender population, and some choose not to have any sort of hormone therapy or operations, but they choose to simply identify uh, as uh, a male if they are actually biologically an XX chromosome female, or identify as a female if they are a biologically XY uh, male. And again, this is, uh, whether you agree with it or not, uh, this, we, we do live here in the West in a liberal democracy. People should be, of course, allowed to uh, live their life uh, however they choose. Uh, that, but that's what the topic is. And again, people have a lot of different opinions on that, but that's essentially what they're talking about when they talk about gender identity. It's basically, you don't match with the biological sex um, that um, you were born with, essentially. Uh, and that's what that is. Um, so, some people, um, ones that do transition or ones that choose not to, uh, they can also express what gender they, they feel like. Um, so it's it kind of, it's not exactly a fashion statement, but it's, it's basically you trying to showcase or live or demonstrate which gender uh, you are identifying with. So uh, that's referred to as gender expression. Uh, so this is uh, expressing gender identity um, through behavior and appearance. So this is where um, you would, let's say you were biologically an, an XY uh, chromosome male, um, but you could express your gender differently by dressing or behaving uh, unlike most typical males to show that you may uh, identify as a female or vice versa, you could be a, a typical uh, XX chromosome female, but you, your gender identity, you feel more like a male, so you may express that by exhibiting typical male behaviors or typical male fashion, whatever it might be. So this is the, the feeling, essentially, of what you feel like you are, regardless of your chromosome composition, and this is you showcasing that uh, to others through your behavior uh, and your uh, appearance. So that's what those two terms mean. And the last two terms, this is really just one, <clears throat> Are, and it's kind of have to do with this gender expression thing, which is why I saved it for later. Uh, there's a term referred to as gender roles. And this is a topic that has also been uh, controversial, certainly since the civil rights movement and second wave feminism, about how we behave if it is socially engineered or not. So are you doing things because society pushes you or pressures you to act that way? Or are you acting this way because you are just simply living out your own personality according to uh, um, uh, your genetics and, and environmental factors like, of course, hormones that influence your development in the womb, uh, which can also affect these, by the way. Um, so there are definitely a host of environmental factors, especially the epigenetic ones, like, again, we mentioned any teratogens or any hormone exposures in the womb uh, or later in life during puberty. Uh, or even synthetically through hormone therapy, those can absolutely have an impact on um, uh, one's gender identity. Um, but gender roles are the typical, typical behaviors, behaviors of average males and females. Uh, these have been morphing, uh, as, especially since the um, uh, 1960s and 70s. So like I mentioned before, we have a lot of 
technological changes that really changed how we live our lives. So the two biggest ones were by far household appliances, which of course freed up women or anybody that was um, doing legitimate work at home. Like, I mean, it used to take six to eight hours to prepare food, cook it, uh, clean the house or do laundry. Like there weren't washing machines and um, uh, laundry, there weren't, what's the word I'm looking for? Dishwashers, that's the word I'm looking for. There weren't dishwashers or laundry machines or ovens or microwaves that made this stuff go much more quickly. They'd have to actually prepare the food or actually wash and dry the things and hang them and fold them um, or, or uh, physically prepare and cook the food, whatever it would, what it would be. There weren't vacuum cleaners and things like that, so they had to actually dust and pick things up. It took much, much longer. Um, so that freed it up so that uh, housework could easily be shared between the two uh, and women weren't, um, necessarily pigeonholed into staying home, uh, which is why now you see a much more, on average anyway, you see a much more, uh, what's what we're looking for? Much more equitable division of household labor. So in most cases, it's not, um, you know, the woman does all the housework. It's both work uh, to some extent, and then they both come home and, and share the, the housework uh, to a degree because it's much easier to do. You can do it much more quickly. So that helped a lot. And so did the birth control. Uh, so women can now delay childbirth or stop having children um, safely and reliably so they're not um, stuck in cycles of pre pregnancy and infant care that would hinder any career development. So as a result, we have sort of a shift, whereas women generally did stay behind and do those things because they were kind of biologically stuck there uh, or technologically stuck there. Now, um, they're a lot more free to exercise their actual well, interests. So if they would rather um, go out and be more career oriented um, at a certain phase or all of their life, they can. And that's sort of changed what gender roles typically were. <clears throat> and that's still a process that's occurring, but that's what we're talking about when we say gender roles. So typical things that men do and typical things that women do, uh, which of course have evolved since the 1960s and 70s for the factors we mentioned. Uh, and they are largely learned um, as far as like what you see typical men and typical women do, but uh, people's own personalities have a, a large bearing on what they, what they want to do. Uh, for example, if you've got uh, a guy who doesn't want to be uh, the sole income person or they like children, they like raising kids or whatever, uh, even if you try to hammer it into them as a kid that they need to go and do this one specific thing when they become an adult, nothing's gonna stop them from doing what they want. Same thing for women. Um, so personality has a, a much more What's the word I'm looking for? Has a sizable fa uh, causal uh, contribution towards uh, your actual behavior. Uh, nonetheless, that's what gender role actually means, and those are evolving. Um, but there is a common theory for this, which is disputed uh, and has been largely um, uh, refuted by uh, some of these national scale studies uh, regarding interests, anyway. But there is a, a theory which is absolutely valid called social learning theory, at least to an extent it's valid, where uh, we are sort of taught uh, traditional gender roles, taught gender roles. But I, I will say this, uh, while that's certainly a factor, um, the larger factors, according to many of these studies and other studies, suggest that your heredity and biology um, have about a 25 or 30% uh, impact on this. Oh, actually, no, I'm thinking about sexuality. Uh, it's got a 40 or 50% um, impact on this. And so do the environmental uh, epigenetic effects from hormones and teratogens as you grow up. The actual social influence is relatively minimal, but it is there. Uh, so it's worth noting that you shouldn't be trying to push your kid one way or the other. Um, you should be, of course, encouraging your kid to go the way they, they intrinsically want to based on their own personality. And by the way, I do want to say that there are several studies that are also along the um, um, uh, sample sizes of national scale studies done since the 60s and 70s and onward that show parents are much more likely to raise their kids based on their kids' personality than trying to fit them into rigid gender roles. So for example, um, let's, let's take a typical father, maybe a traditional father. Um, if he has a daughter, that you know, you would think typically he'd try to orient towards being more of a, a homemaker, family nurturer. Um, if she happens to be super interested in cars or um, she's interested in or good at science or math, almost always the parent will uh, enjoy their um, 
child's uh, excitement, enthusiasm, ability and foster it. Uh, they almost never say, no, you can't do this because you're a girl or no, you can't do this because you're a guy. They generally do uh, go with the personality of the kid. So studies have found, again, since the 60s and 70s, that uh, most parents raise their kids based on the kid's personality and ability, not on what they see as traditional roles that they need to fill. Uh, but there are some um, exceptions and there is certainly some pressure as you grow up by your parents to um, fit some mold that they believe is beneficial to you. But again, studies have confirmed that uh, it's mostly based on the kid's personality and ability. So that is kind of the sum up of these uh, gender differences uh, as far as the contributions that may be social, uh, may be more genetic, uh, or maybe environmental uh, as far as why race it, but hormonally epigenetic um, as uh, people develop. Um, so those are some of the controversial ones and those are what all those topics mean. So if you see them on the AP test, this is what they are referring to, uh, and here's what you could talk about. Oh, I actually remember um, we got to talk about sexual orientation too. So sexual orientation, sexual orientation, is essentially the uh, gender or genders that you are sexually attracted to. So what we find is about 97% of people, 97% are what you call heterosexual, uh, which essentially means they like the other gender. So 97% of people are sexually attracted to if they're male, females, and if they're females, males. Uh, but there is a uh, about 3% difference. Uh, if you look, if you crunch the numbers, this 3% breaks down in, in a couple different ways. So uh, if we take that 3% that are not, that don't identify as heterosexual, um, you have um, some, so for females and for males, you have some that are homosexual, which sexually are attracted to the same sex, uh, and then some that are considered bisexual, which means they are sexually attracted to both um, uh, genders. So for females of this um, subset, you have about, um, in this 3%, you have two uh, out of the 3% uh, identify as bisexual, which means they like, they prefer, uh, they're sexually attracted to both genders, and 1% uh, identify as homosexual, which means they are females who are attracted to other females. For males, uh, it's flipped. It's 2% identify as homosexual. Uh, and then you have 1% that identify as bisexual. You also, of course, have even smaller percentages that identify as questioning or asexual, which means they have no sexual attraction to anybody. Uh, those are extremely low numbers. We're talking a um, thousandth of a percent uh, low, hundredth of a percent, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Uh, but that's what uh, we would consider the um, atypical, and it doesn't mean it's wrong or mutated, uh, but it is, it is um, beyond the majority of people that are, again, 97% heterosexual. So the question's always been, uh, same with the gender differences, is that a genetic component or is it um, something that's reinforced socially? Uh, and the answer to that is, as pretty much always it is in, in, in uh, psychology, it's a mix. What they found is there's about a 25 to 30% uh, impact based on your genes. So there's a good contribution, uh, pretty cons Ding. gotta wait. There's a pretty active, um, I lost my train of thought because of that bell. There is a 25 to 30% chance uh, impact uh, on your actual genes. So they've actually found some um, anatomical differences in the brain uh, in homosexual males, uh, but they found most of the genes that they believe are, are, are um, commonly different among uh, people who are not heterosexual. Uh, it's a sequence of about five or six genes, um, and it actually has a lot to do with odors. So they believe it is, because uh, actually, despite you being not aware of it, a lot of your tr sexual attraction to somebody is, is based on um, olfactory sensations. Um, so they believe that um, that is a, a major causal factor in one's sexual orientation, is those, are those genes that determine uh, your odor and your attraction to certain odors. Um, and the rest they explain as prop, uh, mostly epigenetic environmental factors, such as exposure to hormones in the womb, etc. And then there, uh, of course, is going to be some element of an actual social pressure um, uh, influence that may cause somebody who is in this 3% uh, or other minority to be hesitant to uh, uh, 
carry out or manifest uh, their sexual orientation. But that's what it is, and again, contemporary research suggests since about the 1990s, you've got about 25 to 30 percent causal uh, factor that's linked to uh, heredity, and then uh, the rest is made up of mostly epigenetic environmental effects, and then there are some social uh, influences as well. But that's sexual orientation, gender identity, expression differences, and roles.